God wants you to know. And today we look at the secret of the Lordship of Christ. But before we do, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, we thank You for Your goodness and Your mercy, Your love to us. Thank You for the gift of Your Son that He took our place on the cross and that He wants to live His life through us and in us. Lord, we pray that that may be the case in each of Your children's lives today. May we understand what it means to make Him Lord. May we hear the instruction from the Word of God and open our heart and our life and our mind and our will to the person of Christ and find His Lordship in everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When the Bible talks about your heart, it's not talking about the organ that pumps the blood through your body. Instead, I think it's talking about the control center of your soul, which I believe is located somewhere in our brains. We know that different parts of the brain do different things and have different... Uh, Transmitter passages and impulses and feelings come from one side and other things come from other parts. But I think that somewhere in the midst of our souls there is a throne room. And in that room there is a throne. And whoever sits on the throne of your heart rules your life. Who's sitting on the throne of your life today? What does it mean? The Lordship of Christ. Oh, He is Lord of everything and Lord of all, whether people recognize that or not. He is the God that created them and the God that sustains His creation and the judge of all the earth. And one day whether people will realize that He exists or not, they will answer to the God of creation and realize that the Bible is true. Many today do not. And many of God's children, they do what they want. They take the road they prefer. They pick and choose their areas of service and, and their ideas about truth and error. But we don't have to do that. We can come to Romans 12, 1 and 2 and see how that God wants us to let Jesus be the Lord of our life and how that can be done. I don't think this occurs, this event of, of letting Him be the Lord of our life. I don't think it occurs the moment that most of us get saved. Oh, I, I don't think that we have an attitude that's contrary to that. Surely we come to Jesus in faith realizing that only He can save us and we need Him in all parts of our life. But we're little babes spiritually then. And I, I don't think as little babes we see enough of the scope of what it means for Jesus to have all of our life and our mind and our heart and our time and our energies and, and our wills. I don't think we understand that decision when we're little spiritual babes in Christ. Some may, but most I think don't. And I think we grow and we try to learn God's will and we try to do it and we learn His Word and we learn how the Spirit of God works in us. And as we grow, we come to this place of Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
where we see that there needs to be submission to the authority of the person of Jesus Christ and His Word in our life. And we see what that means. And what does it mean? It means that we come to the place that we say, Lord, wherever on this planet you want me to go, and that's where I'll be willing to go, we say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, be it easy or hard, difficult or, or glorious, misunderstood or not, then just, Lord, I know your will is best, so whatever you want, that's what I want. And however circumstances of life are, whether there's blessing and harvest and, and appreciation here, or whether there's misunderstood and neglect and pain and suffering, whatever the circumstances of my life are, I will commit that to you, believing that you know what's best for my life. Now that's a decision that Christians need to make. But it's not an easy thing. It's not a simple thing. It's a thing that requires some maturity and growth and some knowledge of the Word of God. I heard on the radio a few years back a man talking about the relationship of a wife and a husband. And of course this, the Bible says, is a picture of our relationship with Christ spiritually. Christ and His church is saved once during this dispensation of time. And this man said about a wife and a husband, if a husband will love his wife as Christ loves the church, that she'll have to be in submission to Him because of that love. She will be. And that sounded fine and good. And certainly husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And that will certainly help any wife that has a husband like that. But something in my heart and mind says that cannot be right. And I did not know why immediately. But as I began to think about it, God gave me the answer that that can never be the thing that produces submission to Christ. That is His love. Because He loves all of His children with a perfect love. There's not one of God's children that He does not love supremely or correctly or want and attempt to produce the best in any of our lives. There is no flaw in the love of our Savior for us. It is absolutely without flaw. It is perfect. It is marvelous. It is wonderful. And yet, even the boldest of estimates would only say that that 10 or 15% of those that claim to be saved are living the kind of life that indicates that they've submitted their entire lives and wills and time and service and worship and energy not to themselves or their families, but to the Lord Jesus Christ first and primarily and above all. That is making Him Lord. What kind of world would it be if each of us that are saved was completely controlled by the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Maybe it would be a different world. Certainly, we would be different on the inside if we never influenced anybody else at all. But you know, if love is the thing that motivates us to make Christ our Lord, then all of God's children would always be in submission to Him. And love certainly helps. But there is a decision of the will that must be made to begin this process of knowing the Lordship of Christ in our life. And it's here in Romans 12, 1 and 2. There is a surrender that must take place. There is a realization that must take place in my life and yours. And I want to say very plainly to you, child of God, you cannot live the Christian life. Jesus must live it in you and through you and with you in your own energies and abilities. You can never accomplish it. It must be Him and His power and His person and His strength 
and His love that reaches out through us and in us and changes us and lives through us as we live for Him. And so we say today, as this passage demands, that you must make Jesus your Lord. And why must we do that? What will happen to me and to you if we come to the place where we say, it doesn't matter about my life so much about what He wants. It doesn't matter about my comforts. It's about God's given me these years of time that will influence all of eternity. And what has He left me here to do in this world? I'd be better off in heaven, but God's left me here for some reason. And part of that reason is that He has a work that he, and a talent and ability and sometimes many talents and abilities and works that He's given all of His children to do. He's left us here for a reason. Not that our salvation is not complete. Not that heaven would not be better. Why? What will happen to me and to you if we really make Jesus Christ our Lord? We must make Him our Lord because it's the only way that we can live. We must live. Here you have two things that, that don't go together. They seem to be contradictory. You have on, on one hand that God says that it is our duty and our responsibility and our privilege to give our bodies as a sacrifice for Christ. And yes, a sacrifice was something that was consumed instantly, used up. But the sacrifice that Paul was talking about here is said to be a living sacrifice. And those two terms didn't go together in the Old Testament. The sheep that took the place and, and covered the sin of the Old Testament believer until Christ could come and die for it. Not many of them got up off the altar and dusted themselves off to go back to eat grass that day. And none of them did. And yet, Paul says that what God has in mind is that we give Him our bodies, our lives, our existence, our time on earth, the circumstances of all that we are and that we do. And when we give that and surrender to the person of Christ to work His will and live His power and His person through us, that then we live. <clears throat> we have a misconception even in fundamentalism about what the flesh is. And the flesh sometimes represents what's worst in us. The lust and the evil and the sin and all the, the terrible habits and terrible desires and wrongful things that we want that God says will ruin our lives. But that alone is not the flesh. Many times when the Bible talks about the flesh, it, it has in mind the very best that we can accomplish even religiously with all of our efforts apart from the Spirit of God and the person of Christ in our lives. That was Cain's problem. He, he didn't bring the sacrifice that God said, but he brought the very best crops that his hands could raise through toil and effort. And he brought the thing that he was most proud of to God and said, God, here's the best that I can do. And I want you to receive me because I'm giving you uh, my best. But God rejected Cain and his best because the efforts of the flesh can, Romans 8 says, never please God. And child of God, I wonder about you today. I wonder if you're going to church and even reading your Bible and praying, doing the very best that you can to try to do what God's told you to do and just stopping there. And you need something more than that. You need to trust and depend and surrender to the person of Jesus Christ that lives within your heart and your life. And He can do things in us that we can never do apart from Him. And Paul says that our bodies are to be given to Him. Our lives, our all, our circumstances, our doing, our money and our families and our talents and our time and our energies. There is never a question about 
who is supreme and who is in charge and who is the authority and who is the God in our life. I'm afraid that most Christians really worship themselves and their lifestyles and they want God to bless them certainly, but they want to do what they want to do and serve God in this and that. But no, Lord, not in this area. Not Don't ask me to do this or don't ask me to, to sacrifice in this area because that's mine. If you're going to make Jesus your Lord, you're going to have to give Him your body, your life. All that you are. You're going to have to make a decision to know what that means. There was a little boy one time who was about six years old when his family knew that he was under conviction about getting saved. And they said, Johnny, why don't you get saved? And he said, but if I do, that means that I'll want to do what Jesus wants me to do and not what I want to do. See, he perhaps understood more than his parents did. He had it pretty clear. Though we're not saved by anything that we do and walk, and after we get saved and Jesus comes to live, then he's the one that's to take over our lives and live his Christian life through us. Making Jesus Lord. What does it mean and why should we do it? if we sow to the flesh, if we try to do God's will in the abilities that we have, instead of letting Christ do it through us, the flesh perishes. But what Jesus does will live forever. We must do it because it's what God wants. And I think we've got it all turned around. We think the Christian life is for us. It's so we can have a good family and a good job so we can save our money and not waste it and throw it away so God will bless our lives and our circumstances so keep trouble away and so we'll live a long life and be able to retire early and enjoy our existence on this earth with things that bring us pleasure. Listen, the American dream is almost as much as anything else hurt in one regard, our life for Jesus Christ because people sell out to the American dream. They want a good job that make a lot of money, build a nice house and have a fine car, take care of their family and educate them and have all that they need in life and they think that's what life is all about. What about what God wants, child of God? You can't make Jesus your Lord if you're not concerned about what God wants. Who's sitting on that throne, really? All we say is Him. We love Jesus. He died for our sins, and thank God He did. But in reality, when in your heart of hearts, God shines through the Spirit and His Word, His light upon your soul and that old nature in your heart, Christian, don't you know that sometimes you choose your way instead of God's way? What about what God wants? And Paul said here that he begged us not only to give God our bodies, our lives, our all, but he said that it was a living sacrifice which was holy and acceptable, that is pleasing unto God. It's what God wants. And he said it's our reasonable service. Another way to translate that is it's, a, it's our act of reasonable spiritual worship. It's a wonderful thing to worship our Lord. And child of God, I hope you know when the Word of God says not to do something, it's not because God is up in heaven saying, oh, I don't want my children to have too much fun. No, sir, I don't want them too joyous in this life. It's, we better just make them uh, tough and mean and strict. Listen, God never holds anything back from us, which is good. If the Word of God says that we're not to do something, it's because God knows if we do that, that's going to hurt us and injure us and hurt us and take us from His will and blind our sense of being able to interpret and see and know what He wants in His Word. God's not holding anything back from you that's good. In fact, I think He has most of us just joys lined up and piled up ready to give them to us if we would let Him. But oh, we're, He's so concerned that we 
do what's best for us. He knows that His way is best and not ours. And so we must want what He wants. And we must come to that place of decision, of realizing what that will mean. And say, all right, God, I believe that You know what's best. Your word's true. I'm going to trust and worship and serve and love and adore you and praise you. And that'll be the best thing. Child of God, have you ever come to the place that you've said, All right, Lord, whatever you want. Now, Every day, God has to bring us back to that place very often, but if you've never made that decision initially, it can never be operative in your life. And though Christ is your Lord, you're not letting Him operate the Lordship of His person in your life. Act of spiritual worship, body, will, mind, and soul. Isaac Watts wrote, what else can I give? I'm willing to give all that I am because of what He's done for me. What greater gifts than I can give than that? My praise and my adoration, my love, my, my life. Here it is, Lord. Do with it what You will. Because I want what You want. You'll never experience much of that until you make Christ the Lord of your life. You'll never live, never have the power and person and joy and peace. And trusting that Christ can bring if He lives and controls our life. And then finally, we must make Jesus the Lord of our life because you must find God's will for your life. And something God has helped me to realize just in recent days, I uh, more clearly I've always seen that living my faith and doing the things the Scripture says, trusting in the person of Christ is the kind of life that lets me know what God wants. But, you know, there was something in the last part of this passage I heard another preacher preach on that helped me to see that if, we do give Him our bodies and our wills and our minds and our thoughts. That that's the best way possible for His thoughts to become our thoughts. There's something about that act of surrender and living a few years and letting Christ be the Lord of our life that ought to make us in tune with what this book tells us that God wants. And I hold in my hand today His heart. This is what God's concerned about. Everything He wants us to know and to do and to experience and to understand, He's put in His Word. I have His heart in my hand today. And if I will love Him and love this book that He wrote for me, then the Holy Spirit will be able to make more of His thoughts my thoughts. More of His desires my desires. More of His will, my will, and oh how we struggle, so many of us, should we go here, should we do that? And I know that it, sometimes it doesn't seem to be a very simple thing at all, and sometimes the will of God seems so complex to know just exactly what God wants, especially if we don't have any direct Scripture that bears upon it. But I want to tell you, I find comfort in the fact that if He's my Lord and I trust Him, even if I make an honest mistake through blindness or, or ignorance, and sometimes He lets me do that, that I might learn to trust Him the more, that God can override that mistake and even work that together with everything else for my good and His will. But oh, you'll never know any of that peace and comfort and joy and assurance. You'll never be able to think many of these thoughts at all if you live your life for yourself or for someone else, your family or your mate or your neighbor or your daddy or your mama or your preacher or whoever it is, you'll never know much of the will of God until you make Christ the Lord of your life. Life's so complex. It's so very difficult. 
Some things just aren't simple and easy. And this thing of the Lordship of Christ is that one day you push a button and everything becomes perfect and wonderful and you never have any more sin or trouble or problems. You might even have more. But God will be with you in your troubles and problems. And He'll teach you if you're ready. So that if you've lived 40 years and walked close to the Lord and known His fellowship and you've given Him your will, your body, your heart, and your mind, and soul. Oh, what sweet Christians I've met at the end of their lives sometimes. Not everybody's old, grumpy, and grouchy, and sick of life. Some of the sweetest people you'll ever want to meet are saints that known the grace of God for a long, long time. But you'll have to make Him your Lord. It's a decision in your will. It's an act of surrender. Oh, it'll help if you see how much He loves you, but you've still got to surrender. Give Him your body and your mind and your soul. Let Him live in your life. Want what He wants. Find in your life what He wants. Let Him do in your life what He wants. May God help you to make Jesus your Lord. Amen.